This is part two of Colonial America. This is AP U.S. History, and it's a continuation of our study on period two from the AP College Board curriculum, uh, 1607 to 1756. And so this is the colonial period, um, and we're going to just continue from uh, continuation from period one. We're going to analyze uh, two more regions that uh, made up the 13 English colonies, one being New England and that of the middle colonies. Again, students, it's important that as you go through this process um, that you're looking for uh, similarities, you're looking for differences in, in many, many different areas, uh, you know, in terms of how they differed in terms of government, uh, how these regions differed in terms of their geography. In many cases, ge uh, geographical differences indicated um, the economy. Um, we want to look at the nature of the families and the settlement patterns in both uh, in all three uh, regions. We're going to analyze religion and, and the similarities and differences as it came to that, how they viewed liberty labor systems, what labor systems were used uh, in their economy. Um, and, uh, you know, so and we'll look at many different areas. Uh, relations with Native Americans, of course, uh, uh, is, is an ongoing issue in period two. Um, and then within these um, two regions, New England and the Middle Colonies, what differences existed among the different colonies? And so we will, we will analyze uh, that in addition to many more topics. So uh, first of all, let's let's look at who is going to settle, you know, or what, you know, one of the points we made very, very clear in, 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 in episode one is that what influenced the development of the 13 colonies was largely created, largely inspired by forces going on in England. And so one of the most important developments that ultimately is going to lead to uh, the development of these northern colonies is going to be the Protestant Reformation. And so obviously in 1517, uh, German priest Martin Luther, as you can see here in the picture uh, in the center of the page, Martin Luther uh, is going to lead a revolt against the, the Catholic Church uh, charging that many of its practices are uh, corrupt. You know, he, he makes many allegations you know, against the Catholic Church, uh, accuses them of, of and its leaders of incredible corruption. Uh, here you can see the, the symbolic nailing to the church door at the cathedral at Wittenberg, Germany, the 95 theses. But essentially what he leads is he leads this giant uh, Protestant Reformation, uh, a revolt against the Catholic Church. This, of course, uh, this revolt is going to spread across Europe and really takes hold in England. Um, of course, as we understand, England becomes, um, you know, I, I think that the nature of uh, European politics is, is, you know, England is unique in the fact that uh, King Henry, of course, is going to, uh, King Henry VIII, um, is going to break uh, permanently from the uh, Catholic Church and um, it, because of his divorce with uh, Catherine of Aragon, which was his first wife. Catherine of Aragon, consequently, was a, uh, a princess, a, a, the daughter of of the, uh, the Spanish monarchy. And of course, Spain being intensely Catholic, um, in order to approve divorces, only the Pope in the, in the Catholic world, only the Pope could grant divorce. And, and when, when King Henry did not get his divorce, uh, he is going to break with the Catholic church. He's going to establish his own church known as the Anglican church known as the Anglican Church, or the Church of England. Okay, so when you hear the word Anglican, it's referring to the Church of England. So, uh, and King, uh, 
Henry is going to make himself the head of the Anglican Church or the Church of England. Um, now, before I get into what's going to transpire next, I think it's just a general account of English history is upon the death of King Henry VIII. Uh, of course, he, he did not leave behind a, uh, a permanent male heir. Um, so power is going to transfer to uh, Queen Mary, uh, known as Bloody Mary. Now, Bloody Mary um, was very loyal to her mother. Catherine of Aragon, who is very Catholic. And, and so she is going to switch uh, for about, I think it's eight, like nine, nine years or so, she's going to switch England back to Catholic. And, um, and of course, she is going to get the nickname uh, Bloody Mary because those, who, those English who refused to convert back, uh, she often jailed or sent to the gallows or burned at the stake. Um, so after nine years, uh, when Mary uh, is, is deceased, her half-sister, Elizabeth, Queen Elizabeth, who adored her father, um, switches the country of England back to Protestant for good, for good. And in doing so, uh, really helps initiate uh, a, a, um, uh, the war with Spain, which we know is the, you know, which involved the Spanish Armada and, and the like. And, and you know, of course, England is going to come out of this, um, um, going to come out of this victory, the Spanish Armada against the Spanish Armada as, as a, a rising power uh, in Europe. Uh, I think it's also important to understand, too, that um, with England, that even though... Um, the country is turned Protestant, okay, um, the Anglicans maintained a lot of old Catholic traditions. And, uh, and so there was a group of people uh, in England who opposed um, the fact that many traditions, many practices, um, much of the theology of the Anglican Church was still too Catholic. And so they really sought to purge the Church of England of all of its old Catholic, rem all the old remnants of the Catholic Church. And so these people were known as Puritans. They were known as Puritans. So Puritans, by the way, uh, see themselves as Anglicans. They're proud Anglicans. They're, in large part, they're loyal to the king and to the king's church. They just want reforms. They want reforms. They want changes. They want the church to be purified. Um, but then you've got another group of Puritans who basically, they not only opposed the maintenance of Catholic traditions in the Anglican church itself, but they were actually, they were willing to go, um, you know, when it became pretty much commonplace knowledge that uh, the monarchy wasn't going to purge these Catholic traditions, uh, a group of Puritans known as the separatists attempted to break away, wanted to break away entirely from the Church of England. Now, when you break from the Church of England, you're breaking from the king. I mean, you're, um, this is a very bold move. And so these folks were called the separatists. Okay, so, so try not to confuse the term Puritan and separatist. Um, try not to confuse them, because there is a big difference um, between the two. Um, so also please, uh, go to my website, uh, under colonial America. And I have a lot of articles, uh, secondary articles, uh, really describing, you know, who, you know, I think it's called the name of the articles, how puritanical were the Puritans, you know, how puritanical were the, the Puritans that would be, uh, and, or if you want to big, if you want to dig a, a deep hole and, and really get, depth uh, and really understanding uh, 
exactly who are these Puritans, uh, I highly recommend uh, that article. Again, that's called How Puritanical Were the Puritans. I don't remember the author, but uh, it's a good read. So obviously, you know, you have uh, these, these separatists uh, who we know affectionately as the pilgrims. Uh, they are going to flee Great Britain and, and, and uh, they're going to flee England and go to the Netherlands. Netherlands uh, on continental Europe is, was, they were known for its religious freedom. Um, but once the separatists arrive in, New, in the Netherlands, they, they have a really difficult time adapting. And they're really not accepted um, by the Dutch. So they return home to England and they uh, come to the conclusion that they are going to leave England and they are essentially going to leave uh, for America. Now, they had no legal basis for being there. Uh, they are, I guess, what we would affectionately call, they would, be become, they would become squatters. A squatter is somebody who essentially has no permission to live where they do, you know? So, um, so either way, the, um, the pilgrims, uh, on board the infamous Mayflower, they, they travel over the Atlantic. They, they do it as one congregation, uh, as one church. Um, you know, the leader of the group of course is going to be, uh, William Bradford, who's not only the governor uh, of their, their new colony, but also uh, there are religious leaders. And we'll, we'll get into the nature of, of, of who these, these folks are. But, um, but they, they landed in uh, Plymouth Rock, which is in present day um, Massachusetts in 1620. So this is 13 years after the founding of Jamestown. And so obviously, the goal, so think about Jamestown. Jamestown, Virginia, the Chesapeake colonies, that really honestly the southern colonies in general were established for profit. They were established for profit. They were established by joint stock companies, these capitalistic joint stock companies uh, that was intended to provide England with profit, investors with profit. Now, New England was established on totally different uh, ideals, you know, religious liberty, religious freedom. Now, of course, the Puritans, um, whether they be um, the separatists or the non-separatists, um, they came to America, too, to profit. They came to America, too, to be successful economically. But they were also driven by this mission of religious freedom to be able. So in any way, you, you look at the various uh, Puritan migrations as essentially a goal, an effort to um, seek isolation, um, to build for themselves a, a model Christian society in which they can thrive and flourish without uh, government interference over their affairs. So they, um, on board the Mayflower, as you can see here, uh, and I do, uh, I included a link uh, to the document. It is one of your assigned readings um, I actually created a YouTube video in which I read the Mayflower Compact and we actually go through it. So I recommend that you watch that as well. There, you know, the, the Mayflower Compact essentially created a government. Um, they hadn't even arrived yet to where they were going. They had not set foot on Plymouth Rock. Uh, but they, on board the Mayflower, the, male, the, the adult male members um, are going to essentially create a government a working government, an agreement that would set up a government based on majority rule, self-government, voting. And so uh, like we talked about in episode one of Colonial America, it's important for you as an APUS student to be able to trace the development of American democracy, democratic traditions, uh, uh, American institutions, uh, governmental institutions, uh, uh, ideas of free market economic, economics, economic systems. But this a Mayflower Compact is a important and extremely important development in terms of founding what we know as um, purely American ideas about 
self-rule and democratic forms of government. Um, so, so make sure you spend time with that document. It's going to be very important. So obviously a lot like the, the experience in Jamestown, um, the first winter was pretty rough for those at, at, at Plymouth, the Plymouth colony. And, uh, and less than half of the pilgrims that had arrived in the, in the first wave had passed away. They, they had died. Uh, the next fall, they had a very generous harvest in large part due to cooperation with nearby um, Indians. And so obviously this is the story of Squanto, uh, one of our, our one of our favorite uh, Native Americans. Um, Squanto is going to help uh, the struggling English in Massachusetts actually uh, survive uh, by, by teaching them how to grow crops in this new world. Um, but they, uh, Plymouth is going to be, really exist uh, as a very small um, unit until they will eventually merge with uh, the Massachusetts Bay Colony. Let's talk about the Massachusetts Bay Colony. So this is a group of Puritans. Okay, these are not separatists. These are not. These are non-separatists. And unlike the uh, the separatists at Plymouth Rock, these Puritans actually receive permission permission to settle in um, New England in what we know as the region of New England. Massachusetts Bay Colony. Of course, this is 10 years later in 1630. Um, it's, uh, as you can see, it's 30 miles. Uh, Massachusetts Bay Colony was located 30 miles north of Plymouth. Um, you're going to see over the next 10 years, 20,000 Puritans are going to immigrate. This is what historians call the Great Migration. So you have a, a significant movement of Puritans uh, leaving England and migrating to Massachusetts Bay Colony. Now, um, big thing here. So again, we want to always think about what's going on in Europe. What, excuse me. What's going on in England that's causing these thousands, these tens of thousands of Puritans to come to America? And the, the short answer is Charles I. Charles, King Charles I um, is, is really, he's a monarch that has, he's, um, he's kind of grumpy, right? He's kind of grumpy. He, he doesn't really appreciate these Puritans. He sees these Puritans as rebel rousers. Um, and, um, and so when permission is sought to settle in the new world, Charles I was actually very excited to see them go, all right? He, he was really excited to see them go. I think an important thing, too, is um, many Puritans are going to begin to find themselves being oppressed in England. They're going to find themselves being oppressed. So they are going to, so in many ways, they are getting on a boat and coming to America, coming to Massachusetts Bay Colony uh, to get away from Charles I and his, what is becoming a very oppressive government, okay? So it, it's very clear Charles I does not want to reform the church. It's very clear that Charles I doesn't want to purify the church. So, um, so basically these, uh, these Puritans led by Char John Winthrop, John Winthrop. John Winthrop is the leader of this group, again, uh, I think an important thing that you see in this picture, you know, ask yourself, uh, you know, John Winthrop, of course, located right here in the center. Um, how does this strike you as different from what's arriving in Virginia? You know, what strikes you different as to what's arriving in Maryland and in the Carolinas? You know, what is striking you different here? Yeah. So think about that. You see families, you see children, you see husbands with their wives. So, so when the Puritans came over, they came over in family groups. And oftentimes they traveled as whole congregations. 
like imagine an entire church in England uplifting themselves and moving as a congregation. And they traveled over with their pastor and the pastor was their leader. Well, there is no greater pastor, no greater leader, theologian than John Winthrop, who obviously becomes the first governor of Massachusetts Bay Colony. He chooses Boston, the city of Boston, as the capital for Massachusetts Bay Colony. Um, and uh, he is going to write, and again, this is one of your outside readings. It's located on my website. Um, it's called The City Upon the Hill uh, Sermon. He delivers a very famous sermon in which he really lays down a metaphor that today still survives. And this is the way that he saw America. The way he saw Massachusetts is he saw it as a city upon a hill. So the city upon the hill metaphor is very important for you uh, to understand. And so in other words, what he thought uh, Massachusetts was, uh, and what it was an experiment. It was an experiment. It was, it was an effort to build what he saw as a, quote, model Christian society, a beacon for the rest of the Christian world to look at and to copy and to emulate. So this is really kind of the beginning of where we see what, well, you know, in the study of, of American history, we, we've got this issue of what's called American exceptionalism. It's this idea that the United States or Americans or in general are number one, like we're the greatest country. We look at all the great things we've done. We, we, we're the world's greatest economy. We lead in culture. I mean, everybody listens to our music. Everyone around, everyone around the world watches our movies. You know that we we have the superior form of government. We have the we we have the Constitution of the United States. You know, we're, so we have got a, we're really good in basketball. I mean, so so really this idea of how Americans view themselves as being exceptional, and that the rest of the world needs to be like us, govern like us, think like us, pray like us, um, is first advanced in this sermon city upon a hill, that, that we are this city, that we're the shining city that people need to emulate and copy. And, and by the way, there are many presidents who have used the city upon the hill metaphor to describe the United States. John Adams being one, John Kennedy being another. Of course, in his farewell address in 1989, President Ronald Reagan uh, called, you know, talked about the shining city. So, um, so this is a this is a big moment, right? So this is a big moment uh, in in the in the early colonial period. So first stockholders had government share, all of them male citizens. So so again, obviously, this is a very patriarchal society, uh, which men are going to govern. Colony, of course, over the years, is going to grow very very quickly. Uh, here I put a link to the city upon the hill. Um, sermon. Again, that is required reading. So who are these people in Massachusetts? You know, how are they different from the pilgrims? You know, and really, how are they different from most Anglicans? I mean, and honestly, how are they different from the English that are going to settle in the middle colonies and from the English that, that, that settle in the southern colonies? Is that really the people who established these uh, Massachusetts, right? They're Calvinists. Now, John Calvin, uh, John Calvin, of course, Calvinism. Um, this is this is basically the the Martin Luther of of uh, of the English Protestant Church. He is a, um, a theologian that, that really the, the Puritans really latch on to. They latch on to his theology, and it's really rooted in this concept of predestination. So. You know, each of these five bullets you guys need to understand. So I'll, I'll explain each one individually. Predestination is this idea held by Puritans, held by Calvinists, that um, your salvation, you know, this whole Christian concept of being saved, um, 
that that once you profess um, faith and belief uh, that Jesus Christ died on the cross for our sins, you know, and after dying on the cross, after three days rose from the dead. Um, but this idea that that your status as a Christian for being saved and being, you know, going to heaven is already predetermined at birth that you are, that God knows, you know, God is all knowing um, that essentially um, people are born into nature already uh, and God already knows at the time of birth whether you are predestined to go to heaven, whether you are saved. Now, the thing is, you live your whole life, you know, growing up in the Calvinist tradition, growing up in the, the Puritan tradition, you live your whole life, right, not really knowing whether or not you are predestined. So that's that's pretty uh, scary, actually. It's pretty scary. So one thing you have to do to guarantee to give yourself the absolute best chance to hope that it's true is to live a sinless life right uh to live a sinless life to be very devoted to one's faith so the puritans tended to be very strict right you get this idea that they're a very strict society and you find that um Calvinists hold to this idea of covenant theology, covenant theology. So their covenant theology is actually built into um, a lot of the Bible, you know, and again, this is not a biblical history class, but I will tell you that covenants are pretty important. You know, uh, you've got the covenant uh, with Abraham in the Old Testament where, um, Abraham enters into a covenant with God where God gives him uh, the Holy Land. In exchange, Abraham had to uh, put God first, right? He had to make, he, he had to, he had to obey God's laws. And so you see another covenant with uh, Moses, the whole Moses story, you know, where he leads um, God's chosen people out of slavery in Egypt of course, you got the parting of, you know, God is going to pave, you know, help out uh, Moses by, you know, parting the Red Sea, allowing Moses to cross and then drowning the Egyptian army who's teetering behind. And, you know, so what does Moses owe God? You know, he, uh, God then gives him the, the Ten Commandments and says, you live by these. These are my laws. And if you do this, I will take care of you. You know, and so this is really what John Winthrop saw. Uh, he saw Massachusetts Bay Colony as a covenant. This is another covenant that the people of Massachusetts, these Calvinists, these Puritans, are entering into an agreement that that really who gave Winthrop and his followers Massachusetts in the first place, and they believe that God did. That they, they entered into agreement with God that, you know, God gave us Massachusetts. And in exchange, in exchange, they had to live according to God's commandments, God's words. And so that's why in, in New England, and especially in Massachusetts, you have a lot of the, the, the laws. A lot of the laws and a lot of the punishments come directly from the Bible. Right. So this is a very Bible centered uh, community. In fact, if you go into a traditional New England, you know, Massachusetts village or a city, you know, located in the center of the city is the church. Right. And the church served obviously not only as a place of worship, but the church also served as what we call the meeting house where local government would transpire. But, but even in the building of their cities and the building of their towns and their villages, they chose to put the church physically, physically in the center 
of their their city. And, and, and of course, that's a great metaphor for really who the Massachusetts are, that, that they do put uh, re- their religion central, uh, central into their lives. So that's covenant theology. And, and, and oftentimes, you know, um, uh, they, they were very sensitive to uh, the fact that um, God is extremely active in the lives of uh, people. And when good things happen, it means God is happy. When bad things happen, that means God is angry at them. Um, so they're, they're very sensitive that, that everything that happens is due to God's hand, his invisible hand. Um, but they also felt that as active as God is, um, so is Satan. You know, sin, that sin really enters into the um, uh, sin is kind of a destabilizing uh, force for the community. Right. So so they're very sensitive about all this. And that's why they were very uh, their laws were, were biblically centered. Their punishments were biblically centered. And um, and. And I think another word you want to put here, taking notes, um, is perfectionism. You know, so what the Calvinists really, lead, you know, it's this idea of perfection, that if we live according to God's laws, then we could create a utopia, a perfect society. They believed that that was possible. That's what they saw. When you talk about the city upon the hill, this metaphor, you know, what exactly is it? It's it's this belief that if we are, if we lead sinless lives, and if we constantly are focused on eliminating sin and living a true life according to God's laws, He will not only take care of us, but we can actually strive to create this perfect Christian model society. This is called perfectionism. Okay, so the idea is if you can, um, oh, hold on a second. What I meant to say is even though obviously today the Puritan church is dead, but this idea of perfectionism, this idea of American exceptionalism through this city upon the hill metaphor that we can create this model society that we can constantly try to strive to be perfect. It survived the Puritans. It's a big part of who we are today as Americans is this idea of perfectionism. You know, we, uh, you see in our constitution, we, the people, the United States in order to form a more perfect union, there's that word perfect. So, so we, we get this from our, our, you know, our founding, right? Um, and the Calvinists, um, their theology, uh, it, 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 does, it does stay um, true. So, so what do you have um, in a Puritan society is you have, of course, at the very, very top, if you look at it as kind of like a pyramid, if you look at society as a pyramid, then what you're looking at is, uh, da, 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 da. let's see. No. Yeah. So when you look at it as like a triangle and at the very, very top, who's at the very, very top? Now, you know, in, in the South, in the Southern colonies, it's the aristocrats. It's the big landowners. It's the big planters. It's those that are growing the tobacco. Right. And of course, in the North, in New England, in, in Massachusetts, it's the ministry. It's the minister. The minister yields he, he wields the power. Okay, so the minister is huge um, because the minister knows who in the community, who in his community is predestined. There's that predestination again. Who is predestined to go to heaven or to go to hell? And, and he can aid in this, by the way. That's where his power comes from. And the power is through the power of baptism, okay? So the big goal 
for a Calvinist in Massachusetts is to procure a baptism. And so that's what the minister can do. And so those, so before, now, so, so you got that group. So he does create around him a, a different kind of aristocracy, but it's an aristocracy within the church. Now, if you've been to any church today, you know, I, I don't care what church you go to. All right. We're human beings. We have the tendency to do this. But when you go to a church, of course, you got the minister, but then you've got always you've got a group or usually you've got a group of very influential families within a church or maybe very a, a, a small, small group of very influential, you know, uh, deacons or uh, laymen or however you want to use them. But this is exactly what you have in a in a typical New England, Massachusetts uh, community is you've got the minister at the top and then he creates around him a group, a small group of very influential and very powerful men. And these were called visible saints. Okay, These were called visible saints. They become kind of the, like you'd say, the top 10%. They're, they're the planters. They're the people who are at the very top. They wield a lot of power in the church but they also wield a lot of power in government as well, um, in, in governing Massachusetts. And he's the guy who decides this. Now, they also have underneath, so if you have that third level in that triangle, right? So you think about the New England society as being a, a triangle. At the very top, you got the minister, then you have the saints, then you have what's called the elect. The elect are those people in the community who the minister has essentially selected for receiving a baptism. Now, when you receive a baptism, that means you're pretty much good to go in terms of being saved. And, and so what we find is that through the history of New England, these ministers misuse this power of giving away and granting baptisms that he would, he would show favorites. There would be favorite, you know, a lot of favoritism. People would go their whole lives and never receive a baptism. And, and so he was, he was oftentimes the ministers became over time kind of greedy with the power of baptisms. And this is going to cause a lot of dissension and a lot of anger and a lot of conflict. And this is really what is eventually going to um, do in the Puritan church is the, this idea that eventually these ministers become uh, viewed as being corrupt, um, especially with their power of doling out um, baptisms, the power of doling out baptisms. So, so you started seeing people dissent, right? You start seeing people dissent, um, Here you can see, I'm going to go and show you this. This is a map here of uh, Massachusetts Bay. And, of course, you've got, uh, this is the Plymouth Colony, uh, which is, you know, Cape Cod, that area. Um, and then, of course, to the north, you got Massachusetts Bay Colony. So, like I said, remember in 1691, these two colonies are going to merge into one. Okay, so so what we've got, uh, and I think a big part of the story of New England is the story of how the Puritans over time kind of lose. Um, uh, you begin to see a lot of disagreements, a lot of disenchantments, um, where people begin to see people begin to challenge the power of the ministers. Remember. In the southern colonies, the big issue was these uh, backcountry farmers, these old indentured servants who were given head rights of land out in the frontier, subject to Indian raids and, you know, very poor quality land and they're very impoverished and there's no women and, and they have Bacon's Rebellion. Remember, Bacon's Rebellion was a big moment in southern history. 
Well, in New England, the big problem is that the ministers are becoming a problem for many people. You know, many people are beginning to lose their loyalty and their allegiance. A lot of it had to do with, uh, again, the, the baptisms. People began to challenge openly this idea of predestination. Um, you know, uh, they're just simply people, as you see here in the second bullet, major bullet, is that you simply had people who did not want to conform. They didn't want to conform to God's laws. They didn't want to, you know, one thing is in, in New England, is you, is you don't have a lot of individualism. There is really a major emphasis that's put on what's called communal liberty, you know, that, that you know, there's no I in team. There's no individualism. And people begin to, and I think anytime you get groups of people together, you've got problems when people aren't allowed to express individualism. You know, uh, people are very angry that they can't vote, right? That they don't have a preferential place in the church, that they have been deprived of baptisms. And so people began to openly um, revolt, right? Openly revolt. Let me just advance a slide here and see where I'm at. Okay. So, yeah. All right. Okay. Yeah, good. So we're going to get there. So. So one of the first people, and you see her down here in the bottom right, and obviously this is someone that we we want to know for the AP exam, and what we want to know in APUSH and, and in my class is Ann Hutchinson. Ann Hutchinson was a woman uh, out of Boston who began to challenge the system. You know, I think she's, I like to see her as like one of the first feminists, you know, um, where she really began to challenge this uh, real stringent, strict, paternalistic, male-dominated power structure uh, within the, um, the church. And so she got in trouble. She got in serious trouble. And when she got it, which it's anti-nominism. It's one of your uh, note card terms. But she challenged this idea. See, they, in New England society, and it's basically, I want to talk about Massachusetts. In Massachusetts society, People believed in the church, they believed uh, that God speaks through ministers. That God speaks through ministers, right? So she challenged this. Um, and she, uh, and not just through ministers, but through men, that, that women were to occupy a subservient um, status. They were to have subservient, uh, subservient uh, status um, in Puritan society. And so what she got in trouble for was uh, she began holding prayer meetings with other women and she was prophesizing. I mean, she was, she was reading from the Bible. She was teaching from the Bible. And for this reason, she was put on trial she was found guilty, and she was banished from Massachusetts. Um, and she is actually going to, if you see her on the map, she is going to go to Rhode Island. And so Rhode Island becomes what we call a dissenter colony. Dissenters, dissenters. These are the, the hundreds and, and thousands of, of people uh, in Massachusetts who are going to, for whatever reason, they're going to be banished and kicked out of uh, Massachusetts for disobedience, for disobedience. So Rhode Island became a haven for dissenters. So that is also another very important American idea, the idea of dissenting, speaking out against people in power. That is very American. The liberty to be able to speak out against people in power. You know, and eventually we're going to see it in our Bill of Rights, the right to petition, free speech, freedom of the press. These are all important components in terms of dissension, being able to speak out against people in power. So it took a lot of courage for Ann Hutchinson. But, uh, and then uh, a secondary, let me kind of go back and show you this too. 
a second dissenter. He's a no card term as well. And he's actually the founder of Rhode Island, um, Roger Williams. Roger Williams in 1636 is going to be banished from Massachusetts because he believed that the government should be separate from the church and that the church should be separate from the government. This is separation between church and state. In fact, he called it a, quote, there should be a wall of separation that those two worlds should not be blended. Religion and politics should not be blended. And he got banished. Um, that was not something that was um, uh, acceptable. It was not an acceptable idea. So so he uh, he's actually going to be the founder and, 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 Win and uh, Hutchinson's gonna join him uh, much later um, down the road. So as I said before, New England, uh, the family structures very, you know, it's very structured, very rigid. Uh, family, of course, is is uh, central to everything. Um, population um, boomed in large part due to uh, there actually being women. By the way, there was actually women there. Remember, New England uh, had a, a had immigration of families, whereas Massachusetts or Virginia. Maryland and, and many of the Southern colonies were largely first established by um, young men without women. You know, so naturally, New England is going to rapidly grow because you had a, st a very stable uh, family structure in place. Uh, an average, a woman uh, had an average of 10 births, live births during their childbearing years. So you see a, a tremendous amount of growth going on in New England. Um, family, of course, led to stability and support. Um, you know, this basically becomes your labor supply uh, on these small farms in New England. Um, they have large families in order to uh, sustain their estates. Uh, in New England, of course, women had very few rights. Uh, they were viewed, uh, and we'll talk about this later, uh, especially when we get to the revolution. But the idea is that women during the colonial period, you understand this is the 1600s, early 1700s, women were viewed biblically. I mean, so when you read the Bible and you look at how women are portrayed, you know, there's a reason why men were not willing to give women very many rights. They were viewed as being morally corrupt, uh, weak, um, you know, this is, and, and for that reason, women had, had very, very, very little rights, uh, politically then zero politically, economically, uh, within the church. Um, they were in many cases, second class citizens. Um, adultery, for example, was seen as a very horrible act in which women were viciously whipped and punished. Um, and here you can see. In the middle, uh, that's a, an image from a movie made from a book, which we'll, we'll learn about later in the class, uh, The Scarlet Letter, where uh, the character of the book, Hester Prynne, is found guilty of adultery. So she has to, she's a little Puritan woman who now has to uh, uh, wear the, a scarlet letter A on her dresses to indicate to her neighbors that she is an adulteress. So it was a very strict, right, very strict family structure. Okay. Uh, towns grew in a more orderly fashion, whereas you had very few towns in the South uh, centered around a meeting house, which served as a place of worship and a town hall. Uh, their government, by the way, the government in New England is the town hall meeting. Uh, you can see the town hall right here. Uh, this is actually a picture that I took from an AP test. So just saying. Uh, but the, the town hall served many different functions. Town hall meetings where all adult male members met together and voted. Um, and again, this is representative government. This is the basis of democracy. Um, education, by the way, New England boasted the highest literacy rate in the Western world. It had the highest literacy rate in the world. About 95% of New Englanders can read because of the Bible, because the importance of being able to read the Bible. So I think that's also a, that's a very important distinction uh, about New England. Uh, some of the first universities are going to be built in New England. And these universities 
were originally um, Bible colleges. Yale, for example, Harvard. Harvard was actually the very first one. Established, in, as you see here, in the second major bullet uh, in 1636 to train boys for the ministry. Right. So Harvard is originally a Bible college, um, but literacy is very important. They established public schools uh, for towns of, of 50 or more. Um, and uh, the Village Green, by the way, I think that every town, uh, it's important to know, especially when you talk about the Indian raids, uh, every town had a militia. Every town had a militia and they used the Village Green in order to train. Um, they would have train where they would train. Uh, for combat. So what kind of brings about the downfall of the, you know, the whole house of cards of the uh, Puritan society ultimately revolved around the fact of the Salem witchcraft trials, 1692, 19, uh, women and number of men are going to be hanged as suspension suspected witches and in order to investigate the witch the supposed witchcraft in the, the the village of Salem the governor of Massachusetts established a a court uh, of leading ministers and and rather than really examine the evidence they they there was a a rush to judgment uh and it was a it was a crazy kind of it was a crazy kind of justice where if you admitted to being a witch, then you lived and you escaped punishment. But if you professed your innocence, then you were hanged. You know, so that's not the way American jurisprudence goes. You know, the ideas of and, and we borrow that from the English justice system that you are innocent till proven guilty. But these courts did not these religious courts did not do this. And so, um, and really what does witchcraft mean? It basically means it's this belief that the devil, Satan, is active in your community. That there are those in the community who have been marked by the devil, who, have been in, who are being influenced by the devil. And so, and are doing great acts of harm and evil to people in the community. And um, essentially, the Salem witchcraft trials end after a number of people were, were hanged. And it was known, it became known that uh, indeed a lot of the, uh, that a lot of these people who had been killed were actually innocent. And that these ministers um, essentially committed a lot of innocent people to their deaths. And so the, the, the clergy is, they're going to lose a lot of support, a lot of loyalty. And people in Massachusetts begin to leave the church. And as people begin to leave the church, these ministers begin to scold them. They begin giving these, you know, if you leave, you go to hell and, and then eventually to try to attract um, people back to church. In order to get people back to church, they uh, these ministers then tried to um, entice um, these disaffected people back by granting baptisms to the children to the children of these disaffected people. Uh, and then that kind of undoes the whole predestination thing, you know? So, um, so it really unravels. That's called a halfway covenant. That's one of your note card terms, halfway covenant. So let's get back here, you know, Rhode Island. I've talked about this before. Uh, he's the, the founder of Rhode Island. He's a Puritan minister expelled in 1635. He establishes Providence, Rhode Island, which is going to become the capital um, it was a place, as you can see under the second major bullet, Rhode Island is, you know, known for its giving of complete freedom of religion, not only for Christians, but also for Jews. Uh, there was no required church attendance, no state church. And, uh, and again, there was a general 
equal access to economic opportunity, which wasn't always the case in Massachusetts. Massachusetts, again, in many ways is a lot like Virginia. There is an aristocracy there. You know, um, there it is a it, Massachusetts, for what it's worth, is a place of haves and have nots. You know, it just depended on what was your status in the church. You know, what was your status in the church? Well, Rhode Island didn't have a status in the church. It was it was very chill. Um, I like this uh, down here at the bottom. Um, it received the nickname Rogue Island by its neighboring Massachusetts, uh, by the neighboring Massachusetts people. Um, Rogue Island. And you can see that uh, the dissenters are fleeing via canoe across the Providence River to Rhode Island. You know, and of course, the, the, the Massachusetts folks are waving them bye bye. Uh, and over on the other side of the banks, you see, you know, the people of Rhode Island are uh, welcoming, them, welcoming them. I think it's a great picture. You know, like uh, the Southern colonies, the experience, um, the Puritans perhaps had the worst relationship with the Native Americans because of who they were. They were Puritans. They believed that God was active. His invisible hand made things happen. He also, but their belief that Satan was also active was pretty big too. They viewed Native Americans as the devil's little savages. And so they had no problem um, fighting them. They had no issue fighting them. And when it, obviously it became very apparent, as you can see in the, the picture at the top, it became very apparent that Native Americans, well, Native Americans, regardless if it's the French, or the English or the Spanish, Native Americans really never convert. They don't convert. So what the Spanish did is when they wouldn't convert, they enslaved them. You know, when the French, when, you know, the French try to convert them and when they didn't convert, then the French said, well, shoot, well, we'll just live with them. You know, we'll, we'll, we'll tolerate them because we want to trade with them. Well, the English realized, well, if they don't want to convert, then they must be exterminated. And, and that's really what we have here in, in the history of New England is perhaps some of the most uh, devastating events to happen in colonial history were down here at the very, very bottom. Uh, the Pequot War and the King Philip's War, right? And, and really, these New England militias went and, and carried out a program of extermination. Now, we're talking about an effort to eliminate whole tribes, men, women, and children. Uh, King Philip's War is perhaps most severe. I'd say it's probably one of the most important Indian battles, Indian wars, uh, in, I would say, in American history, in terms of when you look at how savage it was, uh, King Philip uh, was it, which uh, his, his real name was Massaqua. And so, but King Philip was the name that he gave himself um, to sound English. Uh, the people back in London, English back in London heard about King Philip's war, about how bloody and how brutal it was. And, and you know, Native Americans for what it's worth, um, were a lot like the English. You know, when they attacked English settlements, they did not spare women and children, right? They did not spare women and children. Um, so it was very, very brutal. King Philip's War actually resulted, uh, I believe, in the deaths of almost 5,000 uh, New Englanders, um, which at that time, you got to understand, that's a significant, That's those are significant casualties. And so... Um, Long story short, King Philip's War is in Pequot's War, you know, but in King Philip's case, when King Philip was killed, um, his head was removed and it was sent to England where his head was put on the London Bridge, it was put on a pike on the London Bridge. Um, but, but yeah, so you have these constant wars 
constant conflicts with Native Americans. And it was most severe in New England. Now, you had constant warfare with Indians in the southern colonies. But in New England, it, they were of a greater intensity. Okay. So another issue dealing with colonial... Uh, The, these northern colonies, this, this idea of unity and rivalry, you know, um, you're going to need to know going into, you know, the AP exam and, of course, my exams, examples of colonial unity. What are some important moments where these different colonies come together in common purpose? Well, one you see as a note card term and the first bullet is the New England Confederation. New England Confederation, it was a, uh, is where a, the New England colonies came together, uh, formed a confederation to fight off Indian attacks. Okay. Um, and again, these are, these are uh, colonies that don't really jive well together. Remember, uh, and by the way, I'll just go ahead and explain that Rhode Island and Connecticut, to a certain extent, New Hampshire, these are dissenter colonies. They've got, they've got a pretty big beef with Massachusetts. They don't get along well with Massachusetts. There isn't a lot of unity there. But they do unite when, it, when they do have common problems. And the common problem they have are the Native Americans. So, so what we also have during this period, what allowed for even greater colonial unity, and and allowed these, you know, the New England and the middle and the southern colonies to become tighter connected to each other is back in England. This is during the 1630s, okay, um, 1640s and, and the like. You have civil war going on in England. And England was just too distracted uh, to manage the colonies. So the colonies were left alone uh, to develop to become more independent, uh, to grow economically, to trade, to carry out their own trade. Okay, so the big issue, the big issue, and let me just, let me peek ahead here a little bit. Yes, big issue is this guy right here. This is Charles the First, okay? So Charles the First, this is like a, you know, like I said, so much of what happens in the American colonies is in many, in, in many cases, influenced by what's going on in England, right? And so what's going on in England is they've got a King Charles I who is not interested in reforming the church. He's got a, you know, a big beef with the Puritans. Uh, the Puritans back in England, you know, don't like them a whole lot. They, they you know, look, the big thing is the Puritans, um, they want to change the prayer books. They want, they, they believe that, you know, if you go into the, the Anglican church, there's, uh, you still have Catholic uh, uh, idolatry. You've got stained glass windows. You've got other, you know, Catholic prayer books, um, Catholic hymnals. And uh, Charles I uh, adds injury to insult. He marries um, a princess uh, from France who's Catholic. So he marries a Catholic. And, and this basically, uh, you've got this big power struggle between the Puritans in England and the king. And it erupts in a civil war. It's called the English Civil War. Uh, and the leader of the Puritans is a man, is a Puritan by the name of Oliver Cromwell. And Oliver Cromwell uh, defeats the king in, the, in, the, in this civil war, the English Civil War. So... Um, the Parliament, the House of Commons, which was dominated by Puritans, by the way, signed King Charles I's death warrant. So Charles I actually becomes the first European king in history to be, you know, they call it regicide, where they execute the king. And so they execute the king. And then, uh, of course, Charles's family is sent to France. In exile. And so for the next 10 years or so, it's, I think it's like 9, 10, 11 years, the parliament is running the country. 
and they basically run England into the ground. Uh, England is in all kinds of upheaval. So a group of nobles, a group of English nobles, travel to France. They visit with the son of Charles I. You see, here he is. This is Charles II. And they beg Charles II to return to the throne. You know, so Oliver Cromwell is kicked out of power. Uh, the Puritans are, are you know, they, they, they lose power in the, in the parliament. Charles II is restored to the throne. This is called the Restoration. The Restoration. It's a very important event where Charles II is put on the throne and he tries to exert new control over the colonies. Well, one of the couple of interesting things that Charles does is he goes after all of those men who killed his father, all those men who signed his death warrant, one. But what another thing Charles does, and I, I mentioned this in, I may have not, but in episode one of Colonial America, Charles is going to give away land to those nobles who helped restore him to the throne. And that's what the Carolinas were. Carolina, by the way, is Latin for Charles. So the Carolinas. So those were all that land was given away to nobles as a way to reward them. So, so there's a. Uh, but now, Charles II is really going to start to try to, after many years of having independence, he's going to really try to rein in the power uh, and the independence of these New England colonies. He really doesn't like these New England colonies because he views them as not being very loyal. Um, and, and, and part of the process, you know, eventually Charles II is going to die. And what takes his place is Tr James II. And um, James II is, is going to usher in another very, 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 very important event in American colonial history. And it's called the Glorious Revolution. It's a bloodless revolution. It's basically where uh, the nobility in England are going to overthrow King James II, who happens to be Catholic. And even though he's Catholic, James decides that he is going to keep England Protestant Right, he's going to keep England Protestant, but he's a Catholic, and um, James II begins to um, rule with an iron fist. All right, um, he, he, and he begins to offend major groups of nobility in England. Um, he puts in charge. He basically dissolves all the colonial governments of New England. Look at number three right here. He creates a new government in New England uh, where he wants to oversee and dominate New England to rule them with an iron fist. And he puts a governor in charge of New England named Sir Edmund Andros. And the name of this new government, so again, I'm going to tell you, so he briefly dissolves these New England governments, these Puritan-based governments, right? Uh, in New England. New England, he views as being disloyal. So he put he dissolves their governments and he puts them all under the control of Sir Edmund Andros, which the colonists feel the dude's a tyrant. That Sir Edmund Andros is an extension of the king, a Catholic king, and he is a tyrant. They don't like him, right? So, um, so in other words, long story short, the nobles essentially tell the king, hey, listen, if you don't restore our rights and you don't step down from power, then we're probably going to kill you. We're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna do to you what was done to James or Charles the first. So rather than go through this, as you look at number one up here, James the second flees England, goes to France without war and bloodshed. And that right there is why they called it the Glorious Revolution, because they were able to get rid of a king 
who they viewed as being a tyrant. And they were able to do it without a war, without any bloodshed. Okay. And so then the next person in line, uh, the next group in line uh, to oversee the English government, the new monarch was the, um, if you see down here, King James II is going to be replaced by Queen Mary and her Dutch Protestant husband, King William. This is William and Mary. And they, they restored the authority of the monarch, re, you know, they restored the uh, Protestant rule of the throne. Um, but the big thing, big change is this, okay? So really pay attention to what's on the right side of this, this slide. Now, the authority of the monarch to rule now permanently derives from parliament, not God. So this pretty much ends this divine right of kings in England. So now the monarch rules from the consent of the people. Not the consent of God, but the consent of the people. That's huge. Three, because of the glorious revolution, the English colonists are actually going to overthrow Sir Edmund Andros, who they view as a tyrant. Very good. It led also to the creation of the English Bill of Rights. Many of these rights, uh, you know, will, of course, eventually be fought for in the American Revolution. And, of course, this is an example of opposing tyranny, uh, you know, which, of course, is this violation of the rights of man. Big deal. So this English Bill of Rights is a big development, obviously, because it, it does lay the foundation for uh, our own revolution. You talk about what is it, what are English liberties? Well, a lot of American liberties derive from the English, English liberties. You know, a lot of the rights, a lot of the rights uh, in our own Bill of Rights were first located in the English Bill of Rights of 1689. So look at the major provisions. Uh, no taxation without representation. You cannot be taxed without Parliament's consent. That's a, that's a very important provision. No peacetime army without Parliament's consent. Religious toleration. Freedom from arbitrary arrest. Right. So if the government arrests you, they have to have probable cause. They just can't arrest you arbitrarily, like for no reason. The right to trial by jury of your own peers. Now, I'm going to tell you, uh, we learned this in Albion Seed, a reading that is also uh, mandatory, it's when you're outside readings, that the English considered trial by jury to be the most important of all their liberties. You know, why are jury trials so significant? Why are they so important? And the answer is, is that that is your sole protection from tyrannical government, right? It is seen as a protection from tyrannical government, from what we call an arbitrary government. You know, uh, what is to prevent the government from taking everything you have, your life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness? What is to prevent the government, a tyrannical government, from taking everything you have, a jury of your peers? That's a very, that's, that's an American liberty. It's in our Bill of Rights, but we get it from the English. It's a very important liberty. Freedom of the press. The freedom of the press to do what? The answer is to speak truths about people in power, about to expose corruption, people in power. So, so what you see um, in these major provisions is you see that the English are becoming more and more sensitive about tyrannical government. Tyrannical government is a government that acts arbitrarily in taking, depriving people of their natural born rights as Englishmen, right? So what can take away your rights? What can take away your life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness? An army can, an army can, a, re a religious zealot can, you know, taxation, the government can tax you until you have nothing left. That's tyranny. 
right? So separating the king from judicial matters, having a separate judiciary, right? Taking the king out of that, that's big. Basically saying that the king cannot suspend the operation of the laws, right to bail, petition, freedom from cruel or unusual punishments. These are all, I'm telling you guys, this is major, major developments that Americans in the colonies are going to become very, very sensitive about, about the rights of Englishmen. So when we get to the revolution and we talk about how Americans feel like their rights have been violated, come back to this slide, come back to the 1680s, 16, you know, we get into the, the late 1600s and, and look at the development of these rights coming out of this um, glorious revolution. Right. And so and notice that down here at the bottom, they're really worried about the executive branch. The executive branch, that's the king. Wielding too much power. We can't put too much power with the president of the United States or a governor or in the hands of one person. In fact, what you see in the English Bill of Rights, where do they feel power should reside? Parliament. Who does Parliament represent? The people. Parliament represents the people. So, so again, I think the English Bill of Rights is huge, guys, and I, I want you to, I want you to understand that this is something that colonial Americans are going to become very sensitive about, especially at, you know in the 1750s, as we you know we we emerge from in the 1760s, as we emerge from the. Uh, uh, French Indian War, and colonial Americans begin to see um, tyrannical government um, being exercised upon them. Okay, so these English rights are very important. Okay, so anyway. So we talked about this Dominion of New England. I don't want to, I don't want to beat this dead horse. This has actually been called the first American Revolution. This was this uh, successful overthrow of Sir Edmund Andros, remember this is King James, that was his uh, henchman. Um, you know, of course, the Dominion of New England created new rules that the colonies had to follow, uh, that they thought were tyrannical. Um, this included what was called the English Navigation Laws, which limited travel and trade uh, of the colonies in New England. Um, Sir Edmund Andros, as it says here, bullet major bullet number two, heavily enforced these new rules and obviously, as you can imagine, was much hated as were the soldiers and were his soldiers, his, his, his uh, support staff, and of course the Church of England. Um, 1689, you had Boston in open revolt. Now think about Boston. What is the significance of Boston? And I want you to think about this class in period two and as we move into period three, as we go into the American Revolution, what place does Boston play? You know, Boston is founded by William, excuse me, by John Winthrop, who established it as a city upon a hill. It becomes the Puritan capital, right? Uh, think about what Puritanism meant and stood for. Now, even though the Puritan church is dead and gone by the 16, eventually by the 1690s, think about what Boston represented. You know, what other important act occurs in Boston? The Boston Tea Party? Isn't that where the Sons of Liberty are going to hail from? Isn't this where the Battle of Bunker Hill? And, of course, the, the opening acts of the American Revolution are going to be fought just a few miles outside Boston in the communities of Lexington and Concord. So the fact that the people of Boston initiated a revolt against tyrannical government, the government of the Dominion of New England under the rule of Sir Edmund Andros is very significant, okay? Um, so then the glorious revolution in England, and once you have a new king reinstated, it leads to a, re a relaxation of these navigation laws, and we're gonna have what's called solitary neglect. Okay, so that's another very important topic want to address. 
so basically from the 1710s to the 17 to roughly the 1760s, kind of the end of the French Indian War, you got a period of non-interference by the British government in the domestic affairs of the American colonies. So for basically 50 some odd years, the government of England, the British Parliament, basically left the colonies alone. The thinking is that by leaving the colonies alone, they will be more prosperous economically, you know? So you gotta think about, you know, do you do your best work when you're left alone? Or do you do your best work when you have someone looking over you, looking over your shoulder every, you know, at all times? Generally, it's human nature that people do best when they're left alone. And that's basically the idea behind solitary neglect. So really, what solitary neglect is, and this is very, very important, this is a, a period where the English government really doesn't enforce the Navigation Acts. And so the Navigation Acts were imposed, look at your second bullet here, it's very important, second major bullet. Navigation Acts were imposed in the 1660s in order to enforce what type of policy with Great Britain? Do you remember? The answer is mercantilism. Mercantilism, remember, is this idea that the colonies exist to benefit the mother country. The colonies exist to benefit the mother country and only the mother country. Well, for 50 years or so years, the British Parliament is not enforcing these acts. So what are the people of the colonies doing? Yes, they're trading with Mother England, but they're trading with other people as well. They're trading with the French. They're trading with the Dutch. They're trading in the West Indies. They're, they're trading with everyone, and they're becoming very wealthy during this period. And this period, uh, Saturday neglect, is also a period in which the Whigs rule the British Parliament. Now, rule of thumb class is very simple. The Tories, the Tory party, are they're pretty close with the royal government. The Whig party is connected to the people. They're usually anti-monarchy, right? Anti-aristocracy. Uh, so the Whigs are running the product. You're going to find the Whigs are huge fans of the American colonies. They're pro-America, right? So, for example, when the American Revolution does break out in the 1770s, the Whigs back in England are on our side. They're going to be on the side of the American cause. So... Um, so what I'd like to do is I'm going to end this um, second installment of the Colonial America Lecture and um, move on to um, part three. Um, part three is next, and that will be an examination of the middle colonies uh, where we're, we will also look at uh, the significance of the Great Awakening. And that will, the, the third installment, the third video um, will be the final, uh, be the final video of the Colonial America series, period two from the AP College Board curriculum. Thank you.